right, thanks. All right, thanks everybody for being here and welcome to SDC. Uh, as uh, this seems to be my chronic habit here, we have uh, a, uh, uh, caveats. Last year my house flooded and this year I broke a foot, so at least this year I got here. Um, we're, <laughs> this morning we're going to kick off SDC with, uh, with Swordfish. Um, this presentation kind of covers a little bit of everything related to swordfish rather than just talking about what is swordfish we're going to talk a lot about a whole different a lot of different aspects um, so we're going to talk about first you know what is swordfish a little bit of how it works but then we're going to talk about you know what's been happening a little bit in the last year uh, some of the new features and then also talk about how to get started. So a little bit from a client perspective, um, what's going on, what is CTP, how does it work, um, and, what are, and what are some of the elements that we use, I'll put these down, um, what are some of the elements that we use uh, to do that, which include talking a little bit about profiles um, and how, so kind of end to end, uh, some, of the, all, some of the features um, in the Swordfish ecosystem that we use to bring those all together. So I have a ton of stuff in here, I think there's like 40 slides, so I'm gonna zip right through stuff, uh, so hopefully we still have time to answer. We do have like 50 minutes here, so hopefully I'll be able to just zip right through. Um, and so if there's particular points that you have, you might want to just, there's numbers on the bottom of the slides, hopefully you can see those. Um, we can circle back around if there's a particular slide you have questions on. Um, that's just me. Um, so what are redfish and swordfish? Hopefully by now everyone knows what these are. Um, redfish scope is RESTful API standards, standards based management, covers servers, data center, and, and fabric. Um, swordfish is the storage extensions. Um, we cover block, we cover file. We don't really talk much about file. Um, and uh, at some point, we'll probably do a, a Swordfish School video or another separate presentation about file because um, we do have a tendency to ignore that a little bit. Um, but we also cover and have spent a lot of time in the last couple of years adding NVMe and NVMe over fabrics extensions. So a lot of the work we've done in the last couple of years has really been to talk about that. We'll have a presentation later today where Jeremy, here in the middle front table is going to be talking about some of the work he's been doing there. Um, there's another one here, it's on the last bullet, that's talking about storage fabrics management. Um, we're partnering with the Open Fabrics Association um, to work with um, expanding and providing a reference implementation uh, to ensure that all, the that all the functionality is really there to do that fabric space management. Um, and Russ is going to talk about that with our uh, uh, Sunfish. Uh, program. Um, so what does that look like? Um, just a real basic overview, right? We started with Redfish, um, and Redfish has kind of a, a partner hierarchy here, right? So it starts with slash Redfish slash V1, um, and I skipped right over that. John is actually going to talk um, about, he's not really going to provide an overview of Redfish, but what he's going to talk is about some red reference implementations um, and what's really going on and what's available um, out in the market for folks to, to use um, in Redfish. But what Redfish looks like is there's a tuple, right? This is a Redfish, basic Redfish hierarchy. Um, we have uh, a logical and physical split um, and so the logical comes out in, in this is a, sam, a systems example, comes out in slash systems, and the physical should, comes up in slash chassis. So, and then on a system you'll have like also managers, which is where your BMC or your management representation comes through. Um, so we just extend that when we get to, to Swordfish. And so this breaks us down in a lot more detail. Uh, but uh, so we end up using that same basic model. So slash storage is where your um, logical representation and we use chassis, that same, that same exact uh, representation for all the physical side. So this representation shows how that would break out. So we, storage, we show um, you would have volumes and storage pools and controllers. Uh, if that's a traditional storage device, makes a ton of sense as your th kind of your three basic um, uh, uh, objects you'd have. Um, if you're doing a different type of device, um, 
you might you'd mix that up a little bit if you have a file system. If you have uh, uh, NVMe, we'll talk about that in a little bit and exactly how that maps to those same models. But we, we basically use those same same basic um, objects regardless of the of the device type for consistency for the client perspective. Um, the one thing we do add is, and we'll talk about this as we get clear to the end of the presentation, we'll tie back to this same picture. Um, slash registries down here. We add this in on the Swordfish side as a way for clients to tell what you've implemented. Uh, so we can kind of come back and say, what, what functionality is here? Um, what have you implemented? Uh, and uh, do this in a really kind of uh, straightforward way to say, ah, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a block device, you've implemented provisioning, you've implemented replication. Um, you've implemented event notification. So that's what's down in that, in that registries directory down there. Um, so there's lots of different things you can implement. You could implement, uh, and I'll sh I show these in a couple of different fashions because different visualizations uh, resonate with different people. So this is an instance bubble diagram. Um, but this kind of shows what kinds of objects you might instantiate for different types of objects. So this is an external array, what you might have. A, um, you know, a, a, for an external array, you might have drives, storage pools, volumes, and this kind of shows their relationships to each other, right? A very, very simple array. You probably have more of all of these things, <laughs> but you'd have drives, pools, volumes, all related to each other, and this is where they sit, sit in that hierarchy. Um, for a, a, when you add something like mapping and masking, then the fabrics model comes into play. And um, we haven't talked about that yet, but we'll show that, show that in another representation here in a minute. But um, any time we start to add any complexity, we start adding object representations. But mapping and masking is a very common function, so you know, we have, have new representations here. Uh, and we have a comprehensive, comprehensive representation here that shows up and we use the Redfish Fabrics model. So we use the Fabrics model for, for many things. Um, I talked about already about how we add the uh, NVMe functionality and we, we use, what we've done here is when we added NVMe and NVMe for Fabrics, it's, it's block, uh, starts with block, it has some other stuff in there, but what we wanted to do was, from a client perspective, use those same representations. So we've mapped those same, uh, all those NVMe objects to the same objects we're using for traditional storage, um, and only adding new objects when needed. So this is basically a high-level diagram of that. I'm not gonna go into it in a ton of detail, but what we've really done here is said, here's the NVMe object model and, and its relationships. We've mapped those all to those same objects that we just talked about. So we've got the storage object, um, uh, storage pools, volumes, controllers. Well, we can, with those same hierarchy, that actually maps to that NVMe hierarchy. Now, our controllers aren't physical controllers in this case, but they're in the same spot in the hierarchy. And so we can reuse that same model and uh, just map map things slightly differently. So when you have an NVMe um, device, what you can see, what you can do is you can actually see, oh, it's just got NVMe uh, properties instrumented, and, but these are, and these are logical controllers instead of physical controllers. You can actually, if the device had physical controllers, you can instrument both physical and logical controllers using the same objects. This is where, going back to what I showed before, the, that registries comes in really handy because a client can look and say, um, without diving down into all the details, you can say, what is this thing? Ah, this is an NVMe thing. And it's got NVMe features instrumented without having to dig down into tons and tons and tons of properties to figure that out. Um, so this is, I've kind of hopefully given you a really broad swath of what the high level models look like, what the hierarchies look like, and you can do block, you can do file, you can do NVMe, and uh, we're only 10 minutes in. <laughs> so so um, when we dive down again, so we saw that same picture before. So now we've got into, um, 
I said, we're reusing. So here's that example of that same object model reusing for NVMe. Um, so when we look at this same thing, right, so we have flash storage, we have, instead of using a storage object, a storage object now became, becomes a subsystem. And that, that other tiny, tiny little picture, this gets a little bit more detail here. So a subsystem is a storage object, a volume is now a namespace. Um, for anyone who's familiar with NVMe, you already know that, but for anyone who's not familiar with NVMe, you'll hear namespace and you'll be like, what is that? It's just a volume. Um, so um, there's some advanced concepts in NVMe as well, things like endurance groups and sets. Well, it turns out these are just ways to, uh, you know, uh, uh, aggregate um, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, subset, um, name, subsystems. It's either ways to aggregate namespaces or, you know, uh, you know make subsets of, of subsystems, whichever way you want to look at it, which corresponds perfectly to how storage pools are used within, um, within uh, subsystems, with, within storage devices. Uh, so we can reuse our storage pool constructs there. Um, there are some aspects of storage pools that we use in large-scale subsystems that aren't, that aren't used, but there's other pieces that are. So for the most part, that mapping works well. Um, and then again, for our uh, controllers, um, these are now logical controllers and, uh, and not physical controllers. And then for the drives, these are, the drive becomes an interesting one because uh, in, a traditional storage device, the drive is a um, physical object. What we do here is we use the drive to represent a physical object. Um, what we mean by that is there's a whole lot of stuff in an NVMe device that is outside the scope of the NVMe specification and is up to the vendor. All of that stuff goes in this object. Okay. Um, so we kind of hit real briefly on mapping and when we were talking about mapping and masking that there's some stuff that goes over into fabrics. So we're circling back around to here on, in the NVMe space as well. So we can model um, storage things in isolation, but storage things don't live in isolation. They're connected to things. And so that's where we start to get into networking and fabrics. Right, the, the real value of showing what your device is, is how it's connected to the network, how it's connected to the system. And so when we start looking at this, and this picture is, is really talking about you know, the NVMe version of this, but we have diagrams that talk about this for traditional devices as well. Mapping and masking is, is the device's view of uh, one piece of that. Um, then we start to get into what is the fabric representation? And so there's really two things, well, three things that we show there. One is what is the device's um, uh, network model, right? So if the device has a, an ethernet a port on it or a fiber channel port or its own network can, you know, connectivity. The next one is how does it connect to um, the outside world and then the other one is, what are, what, how does it, you know, what access permissions have we, have we granted? So we call that the access rights model. Um, and then we call how it's connected to the, out, the uh, external world, the, connect, the connect, connectivity rights model. So those are the three things here. So we see the, the green here is that network object model, right? That's, the, that's its actual network um, port kinds of connectivity. Um, and then the, the things that are in the fabric model are the connectivity rights and the access rights. So these things are shown uh, here. So we, st you know, so like here's a simple NVMe drive. Ooh, these are a little out of order here. There we go. I'll go back to those in a minute. Um, so the the extended connectivity we have here, showing um, the. Uh, Extended, the extended connectivity here then shows in uh, that fabric model. So the fabric model is used for two, those two things, the connectivity and the access rights. So the connectivity then is 
what you'd normally expect to see in any fabric. Switches, endpoints, zones, that's what we've done for fiber channel, that's what we've done you know, in, in any modeling you've ever seen out of a fabric. Um, we use the fabric then for one other thing, which is showing multi-system access management. So this is where we get to this kind of um, reuse that's a little bit new. So we, we say the device says, you can access me, um, regardless of what the connectivity is, whether it's PCIe, whether it's fiber channel, it doesn't matter what the tunnel is, whether it's direct connect, doesn't matter, it says, it says I'm gonna allow you to access me. That's what's in access management. So that's the same kind of thing that we do in mapping and masking. Um, whether we, you know, we've traditionally called that mapping and masking, but that's, it, it's not called that in NVMe. Um, NVMe over fabrics has a different name for it, which is escaping me at the moment. <laughs> but um, this, is, this is where, how this is modeled. And this is now also under the fabrics, um, which and we use a combination of connections and endpoints in here. So for best practices, we basically say instantiate two different fabrics. Um, so that you can kind of keep these two things clear. But um, you don't have to, I mean, you could mix them. It's just a little easier to keep them clear if you use one fabric instance for connectivity and one for uh, access rights management. So if you look at the mockups we have online, you'll actually see these two different things. Um, so you kind of, I've, I've walked through a whole bunch of different concepts here. Um, but these, these last two are pretty important because it's really the, you, if you want to try and put a system in and see how it's connected and how it's, you know, what it's showing, um, you know, what permissions it's granting to the host, uh, you kind of have to have all of these to kind of show the complete environment. Um, this, is, this next piece is then where what Russ is going to talk about later comes in, which is, um, how do we verify that that whole thing is complete? Because there's a line where you end up, you, you can stop seeing what the swordfish piece of the system knows about, right? What, what the device knows about and what the fabric and what knows about. And that's where Sunfish comes in. And so Russ will talk about that. I think he's the fourth presenter today. So Russ, Russ, will, Russ will be, be back and we'll talk about that a little bit. And so that's where fabric management comes in. So Sunfish is taking a look at that and we'll talk about how Sunfish is going to work with the Swordfish devices in the ecosystem to present comprehensive management. Uh, so that's really, cre really key there is to basically look at you know, how we're doing open source and standards-based management there to say we can actually see a comprehensive view of the entire ecosystem. Look at Redfish, look at Swordfish, to say, and look at CXL, you know, look at, look, at, look at the fabric devices themselves to say, um, is everything there and is everything um, complete? And all, the, all the, mo the models and management. Um, okay, so if we look at, at uh, a NVMe over fabrics instance, um, you end up with all of these components in the system. So let's see if I could point to, you know, all of them, for example, we end up with, uh, the connections over here, um, this, this one shows, uh, shows, this one shows connections and, and not, um, uh, does not show the, this one basically just shows a connection since it's, it's really hard with all of these objects to show the connections and um, access rights on the same one, so this one just shows just shows the uh, the uh, connectivity instant instantiations. Um, in this particular case, um, the instantiation would basically say access rights are granted across the board. Um, but you can see here we have uh, this case is demonstrating a logical NVMe uh, instance that sits on top of a physical instance. Uh, the key things we're trying to show here are really over here. Uh, 
So there's a lot of a lot of different permutations and things that are available. Um, I'm going through things very fast here. I know um, the. Uh, all of these are available on swordfishmockups.com. We also have all of these if you want to download them and look at various instance in, in versions of them. Um, I have them available on uh, Docker, uh, Docker Hub um, as containers that you can download and work with. So um, we have an emulator that um, allows you to download all of these all of the variants, um, and all, any of these that I've shown, we have about 20 some variants uh, of um, example um, mockups, and all of those can be uh, in any of the ones you want to create as well. Um, all of those are available, and you can download them uh, either if you see the mockups of them, we have them available as containers on Docker Hub. So the emulator allows you to run um, all of them as if they were live-ish systems. Basically, it's a starting point, and you could put post, patch, delete, uh, modify any of the configurations. Um, and uh, so you can check those out, and I have a link at the end. OK, switching a little bit to what's new. Um, so in the last year or so, we've added, um, yeah, we, we've Prior to, prior to this, we'd added kind of a bunch of comprehensive functionality for NVMe and NVMe OF. Um, but we'd focused that on adding into um, a kind of a 1.4 level. Um, we created what we call the NVMe mapping guide. So we have updated that and realigned all of the functionality to map to um, NVMe 2.0. Um, so when we did that, we also at, you know, aligned to a bunch of the um, latest functionality. We added support for NVMe smart metrics. Um, we also, at the same time, added support for metrics um, for a bunch of other objects. So I'll talk about what that looks like in a, in a couple minutes. Um, one of the things we also looked at was um, some of the more recent NVMe functionality like uh, the uh, discovery controllers. And um, discovery controllers are really complicated. So we spent a fair amount of time going, how do, we, how do we do that? And then we threw all that work away and said, oh my god, we don't need to do that. Clients don't actually care. So we came up with a really simplified model for how to present discovery controllers to Swordfish clients. Um, because it turns out that a whole bunch of the stuff that folks are doing in NVMe um, at the device level, swordfish people shouldn't care about. Um, so um, I'll talk about basically um, all of those. And the other thing we did was the enhanced mapping and masking model, which I've actually already shown you, um, which is we moved that from uh, the storage groups object to the connections object. So I'm not going to show you that again. I will just tell you that we did that and that I've already shown that to you. Um, so um, metrics. Um, the way metrics work in Redfish, um, this is my. This has changed a little bit over the years. Um, metrics used to kind of just be arbitrary properties around, um, but one of the things that uh, Redfish and Swordfish have been doing has been moving them to. Um, object called metrics that are attached off of various, uh, you know, attached off of kind of in a st relatively standardized way off of each object um, or most objects, not necessarily each object. Um, some of them used to be like slash object name metrics as opposed to just slash metrics, but there, we're trying to get some standardization around that. Um, so we've gone through and added in. Uh, metrics for storage controllers, drives, uh, volumes. Um, we'll be adding ones for storage pools in the next release. Um, and here's kind of what those look like. Uh, that's a bit of an eye chart for in here. Um, you, that's what you get for sitting in the back. Is uh, ah, see, Glenn is the smart one. He's sitting in the back looking at it directly. So. Um, so uh, I will just tell you that I can't even see them on here. I'm going to be leaning way forward. So uh, there are two things here. One is I mentioned in the 
couple of slides ago that I put in, that we put in the NVMe Smart Metrics. So a big chunk of what you see on here is the NVMe Smart Metrics. Um, so I'm going to tell you one of the things we did here, and then I'm going to encourage you that if you have um, um, there's there's a basic principle that I have glossed over and I don't think I've mentioned generally in any of those swordfish presentations, but in every object there is what we call an OEM property. And um, so if you want to add OEM fields into a, a prop, into anything in Redfish or Swordfish, you can just plop them right into the OEM property. Um, if you're going to do that with any log pages or anything like that, I would strongly encourage you to do it in the way that we do the NVMe Smart Metrics here. Um, the NVMe Smart Metrics uh, we have done in a way that basically corresponds that this entire block corresponds to a single get for that log page. Right? So we're not going to allow this to be extended in a way that violates the this corresponds to a single get. Now this requires a little bit of tweaking here um, on the Swordfish side, not on the NVMe device side. Uh, like you have to reformat some of these things to match the, uh, for, the format requirements, just to make them super client friendly. Like, but that's it. Um, but that is, you know, we'll assert that that is also a very, you know, very strong best practice. Is don't turn, don't create objects, even in your OEM side, that court that make it really difficult to go, you know, to turn into a ton of gets on your um, device side. Um, okay, and so then beyond that, you can actually see here there's things like, um, you know, some of these property names are horrible. Um, we blame that on NVMe. <laughs> you, the, the NVMe names on these are really, are really long and cryptic, so this is, uh, you know, this is as much a translation because the clients that are going to be using this are not necessarily end clients on the NVMe smart metrics. Um, this is, these are a little bit down the stack. We don't expect um, necessarily DevOps guys all to be the, the consumers for these. They actually need to be folks that are going to be looking at the NVMe spec. So oop, in this case, the, the names on these are not exactly this is the most super end, end user friendly. So normally we try to get the names a little bit nicer, um, but in this case they're it was kind of a little bit of a, um, you need to be able to look, since, since folks need to be able to look at the NVMe spec to figure out what they are, they're kind of in the middle here. Um, other than that, you can kind of see how the, how the metrics are evolved here. Um, for drive metrics, um, and um, for the drive metrics and the volume metrics, uh, you will see kind of a little bit more traditional what you would expect to see for metrics. I don't think I put them all in here. I, I think I just use this one as the example here. Um, and uh, a little bit more user-friendly names and descriptions. Uh, okay. So next, the centralized discovery controller. Um, and just, I will also note on this one, I'm gonna go through this with just kind of a little bit of an overview. Um, Curtis Ballard and I will be doing a webcast on the background on this, um, more details, uh, only about a 20, 25 minute webcast on this in a month or so. So um, if you want more details on that, watch for that webcast. Um, but the basics here are a centralized discovery controller, you know, works at the NVMe level to aggregate information to um, report the discovery information from the full fabric. So this is the device side information aggregating a, uh, all the information together and reporting it back out. Um, so this is not, this is not uh, clients or hosts necessarily coming in and injecting the information. This is basically all of the NVMe devices aggregating information together and reporting it out. It's a really simplified explanation. Curtis has a much better one. <laughs> so when Curtis and I do the presentation, he describes all this part. 
Um, so the way we've um, the way we've described all of this and modeled all of this is very very simple. Um, and the key is really that last part, is that the, the, the NVMe devices work together to do all of this and represent that information up. The host doesn't inject it down, and the clients don't represent it down. So, first bullet item here, they require no configuration by the end user or client. So, because they don't require any information represent, or configuration there, we have an extremely simplified and read-only model to represent this information. So we have the information in only two places for this whole model. Um, and like I said, I'd, I'd like to go into this part in more detail because I'm actually really proud that we, of the, how we came up with this after, this is one of those, the sausage making was just horrible when we went through it. Um, but uh, it's, the, the model here is really, really simple. We have information in two spots for, to represent this entirely complex thing, which is, if you look in the subsystem, the subsystems themselves then contain pointers to the other subsystems that have the discovery controllers in them. So basically, a subsystem can tell you where the, what, what discovery controllers know about them. And then the discovery controllers point to subsystems that they know about. And so you'd expect the second one, right? Discovery system, subsystems could say, who do you know about? There they are. But then every device can point back to say, which discovery controllers know about me? And that's it. And it's, it ends up being really, really simple for us to model it. And we don't have to go through any of the complexity on um, the, whole pic the whole previous picture. So, um, the, the mock-ups uh, here show, um, this actually just shows a single discovery controller that you can have multiple discovery controllers, um, so which, but this supports all of that as well. I just, uh, our mock-up, we just, I just did a single, single discovery controller. So we have um, uh, in the storage object, if you remember that this is a subsystem, we show, Here's the, here, we added a link in my subsystem. It says, here's the discovery controller that, know, or the subsystem that contains the discovery controller that knows about me. And then um, one over in, this is in a discovery controller. Here's the subsystems that I, that I know about. And it doesn't point to, um, controllers that it knows about, it points to subsystems that have controllers that it knows about, because um, it's a weird, NVMe is really weird about subsystems versus controllers. It actually knows about the controllers, but you point to the subsystem because transient nature of behavior of NVMe. Um, okay. Let's see, so we have, I'm doing okay on time. Uh, let's see, all right, so how to demonstrate compliance, uh, or conformance. Um, I've, talk, I've hit on this like two or three times, right? So I'm um, just kind of switching gears and going back a little bit here. Um, we have the features registry. I talked about that registry's advertised features. So what, what are they and how are they defined? Um, so these are really descriptions of functionality that the implementation is advertising that it supports. Um, so this is an area right now, we kind of do this at the entire service level. Um, but I will tell you, we're actually gonna work on making this more granular. Uh, we've, we've left that alone for a while, but I could tell you that you know, the service that Intel just implemented is the reason we are going to make this more granular. Uh, because we, we need to be able to show that different resources in the system um, implement different things and can advertise different things. Uh, we knew this, this was going to come eventually. Um, it's just we need to do it now, so we're going to do it. Um, and just as a note, M Intel just implemented a NVMe, um, a, 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 and we have, right now it's running on... Uh, Red Hat Linux, but we'll port it to others, but we have an open source NVMe um, service that um, discovers and manages um, SSDs attached 
uh, to um, any Linux system. So um, that device passes CTP. Um, and pass it, well, a later version of, than this one on the screen, by the way. Um, so how this works, uh, back, to the, back, back to our regularly scheduled programming, um, how this works is basically, um, this is an example uh, that from you know, one, one of our online mockups, I've got the link down below here, um, that says, I, you know, this mockup advertises that it supports an NVMe drive. And so all you have, the client has to do is come in here and query and says, what do you support? Ah, I said, I'm an, I support the NVMe drive, drive feature. Well, what that actually does is that corresponds to this really detailed list of behaviors that are specified in the corresponding profile. And voila, I updated the map, it got more complicated. Um, here's the list of profiles. So profiles in, can inherit from other profiles. They can, they could, it, some of these are either or. Um, it can be either this one or this one. Um, and so if you looked at like down here, the eBOF one, it requires you to support the ethernet attached drive, which requires NVMe drive. Um, it requires access rights for ethernet. It requires connectivity rights for ethernet. It requires management controller. Um, so you can see it's got a bunch of things. That way we don't have like one great big, one great big profile that's got all, all these details that are also in other ones. So you can go to like uh, management controller and it's this light, nice tiny little chunk that we can reuse all over the place. And you can look and just say, here's this little specific thing that says, if you have a management controller, you need this set of things. Um, and uh, Swordfish Discovery is a base one that a lot of them depend on. Not quite all of them, but a lot of them depend on. And uh, so we've got those all in nice little chunks and then you can, in back to your features registry, you can define and say, ah, I support that one. So what we do with CTP, um, CTP is a vendor neutral program. We have Swordfish CTP. Um, we have four companies, I think, that are members of the C uh, performance test program right now. Um, maybe five, I forget the exact number. Um, that, uh, Basically, you implement, you run it through the conformance test program, and um, the ZTP is all based on open source tools, and it basically checks to see, do you actually support those? Pops out the end and says, hmm, yep, you do, you don't, here's, here's your, you know, how, how you do that. Um, why do you want to do that? Uh, well, we have, SNEA has been running conformance test programs for years. Um, and Tom in the back, we have the group Tom, yeah, there we go. Uh, Tom has actually been, uh, has work, been working for SNEA for, I think we verified this morning, 22 years, um, has been affiliated with those programs for a very long time. We ran this, the SMIS conformance test program for uh, many of those years, and now we're transitioning to Swordfish. Um, we have a, a tremendous history of running strong value add and get, delivering strong value add for these programs. Um, increases in interoperability, uh, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, enables vendor choice, lowers, lowers TCO for clients, um, reduces integration costs. There's, there's a lot of value to, to delivering these programs. We've, we have a, a website where you can go see the entire history of every vendor that's, de that's delivered, um, um, de delivered conformant programs. Um, CTP corresponds to the uh, bundles. So um, latest bundle that we're working on delivering to is the latest version of Swordfish, 125A. We basically do the last two versions. So we have 124 and 125 um, we're, that we can work with. And what it looks like is um, we, we, we leverage and extend same way we do with Redfish. We leverage and extend the Redfish tools. So we have some tools that they don't have, um, but uh, basically create a bundle um, within our CTP program. And um, this is what you'll see internally, but 
you know, when you're running the tools, you'll see a set of tests and a set of results like this, but that's not what gets published. You only get, we only publish the ones that actually pass. So we have things that run uh, protocol, service, URI, we have our own registries test, it's obviously it's an ES specific thing. And we test against all the profiles that you advertise. You can also test against your own profiles, you can test against um, profiles that you don't advertise. Um, and then, you know, validated results posted here. Um, So the test, test results, you can see this one is all happy. Um, if something does fail, there's a pretty descriptive test. There's also comprehensive logs that help troubleshoot as to what's actually going on, which this one's kind of sm Yeah, so like this example actually shows that this one is missing, the property is missing and needs to be instrumented. Um, Okay, so um, kind of, so where to find more? Um, we've covered, I've covered a whole lot of different things within the Swordfish ecosystem. Um, to go find information on any of those, start at snea.org slash swordfish. Uh, pretty much everything I've talked about today, you can find a point or two at snea.org slash swordfish, uh, <coughs> um, uh, including the CTP program, which is, um, at uh, a part of the uh, storage management initiative, uh, which is snea.org slash CTP or snea.org slash SMI. Um, so, uh, questions. Where do folks have questions? I got through that really fast. I had 39 slides in 40, uh, 40 minutes. <laughs> I have a question. Uh -huh. So imagine I want to uh, use a uh, swap fish, swap fish, okay, I want to install it on my system. What do I have to develop? Nothing? Do I have to develop some plugins? So how much work is it to get it working? Okay, what kind of system? For example, Linux boxes, a bunch of Linux boxes, with a DME device, and you were for a fabric, and I want to use Scorfish, okay, I install it, and what do I have to Okay. He, okay, so the, the question is effectively he wants to use Swordfish. What does he have to do to get it? And so um, if you are the, so the Swordfish is effectively needs to be provided by your system, by your storage device vendor. So it, how you get it is going to depend on how they provide it. It needs to, so if your device is an array, it should be provided as part of the array. Um, so you might need to go in to the device's management interface and turn it on. Or you may have to go back to your vendor and say, okay, how do, is it, is it included? Do I, you know, how, when are you gonna deliver it? Um, so I also just talked about the um, in, uh, Intel providing an NVMe um, uh, service for, uh, that runs on Linux. Um, so if you're trying to talk to NVMe devices, um, we'll be providing one that if, if you're running on Linux and the cert, you, you're looking for that, you might be able to have on Red Hat go download that and run it to get instrumentation for those. those. So there's, another, there's alternatives, right? There may be, I have to go download a plugin on Red Hat to get instrumentation for these NVMe devices. It might be I have to go enable something on um, the BMC for the server. It might be I have to go ask my storage device vendor to, uh, to enable uh, a component. Um, so it's, it should, but it should be something that's provided by your device vendor or comes as a, as a software plugin. I was thinking it would just apply when starting of the host, no, it has to go with the device. Yeah. Right. Glenn. Right. So um, storage appliances from the major vendors typically have a physical layer of their own storage, NVMe, let's say. 
they have software and own compute memory that accesses the stories or consumer of that story. And then they take that, virtualize it usually, and then provide their own storage constructs up to hosts. Right? So as I'm looking at the diagrams that you showed earlier, some of the, you know, a lot of the, the collections and single things and all that kind of stuff, and I, I understand the limitations of the presentation we did. Um, is there um, uh, a better organization of these objects that pertain to clients, internal operations, back-end storage constructs, uh, so that someone could more easily, I guess, understand the relationships between all these things functionally, not just uh, quantitatively? Okay, let's see, repeating the question. Um, the, with the, Relationships between, um, so we, we've, we've presented the kind of the view from a low level device, maybe device centric view. Is there a way to present the information or reflect this um, a little bit from a, um, maybe a higher level client centric view down? Um, Couple of, yeah, a couple of things. One is um, when you're looking at devices, you know, this is kind of a way to look at things from a um, model view. I've shown a lot of modeling pictures here rather than kind of an aggregate view when you have a lot, a lot of devices um, instantiated. So I think um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the bubble diagrams, I, I skimmed over a few of the bubble diagrams. The bubble diagrams will actually be a different representation that say, when I have a lot of things instantiated, this is what it's gonna look like. And um, Chris it wants to make a comment here too. Uh, Hang on. Um, I've done this math before uh, on one of our ways to try and make sure that we make it. Chris? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Chris, Chris wants to answer, so I'm going to make him come up to a mic to, so we we'll get it on the recording, and um, then I uh, will have a follow up as well. Because, so, when are you? Come on. So I've done this exact, I've done this exact modeling before. Uh, we have an array that we want to make Swordfish compatible, uh, and it's got its own REST API, which I can use. It's got its own management API. Uh, it's also got its own management GUI, but to make Redfish work and Swordfish work, what I had to do is get over the nomenclature. For instance, this device might call it a folder, when in actuality, it operates like a pool. Um, I might call it a volume collection, and Swordfish might call it something slightly different. Really, it's just a matter of making sure that you map the concept to what it actually is. So, one type of array might call it something differently, you just need to know what the mapping turns into. The uh, Swordfish model is abstract enough such that you can actually make, com, uh, model very, very complex arrays and very, very complex interactions directly in the Swordfish model. It's just a mapping operation, and it really is that simple. So would there be one implementation of Swordfish from the, from the storage controller down into itself for its own management, and then one implementation up to present to clients, perhaps? Um, depends. Most likely you're going to have it from the array to the clients. Because the, from the array down to its lower level devices, they, they're going to use whatever they need. Well, if you're in a service provider environment and you want to implement many different kinds of arrays in a oh, sure. way, that's why that's the down way. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I've seen, a large, I've seen large service providers that are using Redfish and Swordfish to manage their back end while at the front end they're using something else to present to the customers. So yes, it can be used between the service provider and the hardware devices or between the service provider and the clients. So the two different points you're talking about, yes, absolutely. That's what I, that was my question. Yep. Thank you. And again, the Swordfish provider could be directly implemented on the device itself, the array, the server, whatnot, or it could be done as a proxy. You could have an off array and actually proxying commands in. Uh, and just to highlight, his his um, his 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 tag says sidekick. So, okay. Uh, so the one thing I did want to highlight here is that you know following up on Glenn's 
Um, okay, thank you, and she says out of time, so let me just highlight one thing, and then I will wrap up, and um, the, uh, uh, the question about, about layering, um, ta listen to Russ's presentation as well, because we do exactly this in Sunfish. We use redfish and swordfish at different layers of the system for different things. So we have agents that do redfish and swordfish, so redfish at the top, proprietary at the bottom, but then in sunfish, we actually do redfish and swordfish out the top again. So um, we have this exact architecture and have explicitly made that architectural choice to say we want redfish and sunfish, or redfish and swordfish here, but we also want redfish and swordfish here. So, um, and it's the exact same architectural choice we made there. All right, thank you everyone.